today. Let's turn to God's word, shall we? And it's Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1. Now then, with uh, me, just use a little bit of imagination. Think that you are Matthew. Matthew, the writer of our first uh, gospel, we read about his uh, his conversion the other the day when Jesus said to him, come and follow me. And he's you know, putting his uh, gospel together and imagine that he's in something of a dilemma. How is he going to make his readers sit up and take notice of what it is that he's got to say? Don't know about you, but if I start reading the book and the first few pages bore me to tears, I'm unlikely to get very far in, in that book. So how is Matthew going to grab the attention of, of his readers? Now, he's collected some great material for his gospel. Uh, gospel, of course, being the edited highlights of the life, work, ministry, execution and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. <laughs> he's got some details about his birth. In fact, he's put enough in to keep nativities, got plays going for centuries with a bit of imagination. There's Mary and Joseph, there's the angel, there's Herod, there's the wise men. He's also got the things that Jesus said and taught and how they electrified people when they heard what he said. He's got good examples of that. And he summarized that, uh, for example, in chapter 7, verses 28 and 29, talking about the crowds being amazed, not for six, because of his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. And the things that he did regularly astonished the crowds. And he's got some examples of that to put in his gospel. Matthew 8, 27 and 9, 8. The men were amazed, again, not for six, and asked, what kind of man is this? He says, the disciples, even the winds and the waves, obey him. And when the crowds saw him, they were filled with awe. And they praised God, who had given such authority to man. And he's got, you know, how he chose uh, his disciples and how he licked them into shape, especially that Peter. No problem, got enough on that there. And he's got a whole chapter on the things that he said that absolutely infuriated the religious authorities and the political establishment. And there's quite a bit of that in Matthew chapter 23. And there are seven Jesus didn't pull his punches, woes pronounced upon the fact, woe to you, you hypocrites, he says again and again and again. And then, of course, there's the events of the final week, his trial, his crucifixion, and there's no shortage of gripping material there for Matthew to put in his gospel and his resurrection, his part in words, the mandate to let the world know that's quite a powerful ending, thinks Matthew. Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, as you go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And then he says, and surely I am Emmanuel. I am with you to the very end of the age. So Matthew's got you know, quite a bit there to pack in. But again, how did Matthew think he was going to grab his readers' attention from the word go? How was he going to make them sit up and take notice and draw them in to read the rest of what his gospel has got to say? He's writing, mind you, uh, for Jews that he particularly wanted to convince that Jesus was the Messiah, the son of David. So there's a particular, what we'd call a target audience in Matthew's mind. Then I imagine Matthew thinking, well, how did my friend Mark do it? Well, Mark just dives straight in with Jesus as a, a grown man um, announcing the kingdom of God. Well, he can't do that. That would be out of sequence with all the material he's got about the birth of Jesus. He's, he's got to start further back. What about Luke? Ah, yes, the personal touch with Luke. Oh, most excellent Theophilus. And Matthew thinks, oh, Luke always was a bit of a flatterer. No, I can't go down that road. We'll have to do John. Ah, well, he hasn't written his gospel yet, but probably it'll be a bit of a theological start. And so Matthew was right. John, and in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, etc., etc. Tell you what, I'm going to read 
Matthew's way of grabbing people's introduction, and the, the end of which you'll be very glad. I didn't ask any of you to do this. Matthew chapter 1. The genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. A little link there with the Old Testament. The actual word is the genesis of Jesus, the Messiah. Go right back to the beginning. Abram was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Aminadab, Aminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz whose mother was Rahab, Boaz was the father of Obed whose mother was Ruth, Obed the father of Jesse and Jesse the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam, the father of Ibijah, Ibijah, the father of Asa, and Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram, Jehoram, the father of Uzziah, Uzziah, the father of Jotham, and Jotham, the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Ammon, and Ammon, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, the father of Abihud, and Abihud, the father of Elikayim. Elikayim, the father of Azor, and Azor, the father of Zadok. I think they docked the priest and handle this music. Zadok, the father of Achim, and Achim, the father of Elihud. Elihud, the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar, the father of Nathan. Nathan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who was called the Messiah. Thus, there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Quite an unpromising beginning, don't you think, for the greatest story ever told? How many marks out of ten for gripping us shall we give Matthew for his opening gospel? Oh, no, this is taken. What? What was Matthew on? Is a good question we might ask. Because if, you know, we were... Is that my mic? If I was the uh, his editor, his copy editor, I said, Matthew, go and rewrite the introduction. Come up with something far more interesting. Because let's be honest, you and I, when we get to one of those long lists of genealogies in the Old Testament, are you going to admit that you just move on quickly? Yeah. Yes. Those lists of names. Oh, and, and that's how Matthew starts. But perhaps he was on to something. After all, people's roots are important to them. In fact, the BBC's Who Do You Think You Are program is now in its 18th season. Very often, there's a sense of identity bound up with people's ancestry. And when you watch that program, sometimes you discover that what they find out about their ancestry delights them, and sometimes it appalls them. Sometimes they are dissolved in, in tears. And on that BBC website, there are tips on how to research your own ancestry, and there are other websites dedicated to the same. I've done my own bit of research. I thought, how on earth did I end up with my surname and its peculiar spelling? Um, so I've done a bit of research back, but that's uh, another story, um, uh, which, of course, is very interesting. One day I might share it with you, but whether you find it interesting or not, there is another story again. But you see, ancestry was big news in Matthew's day, and especially to the Jews that he was writing for, his target, his target audience to grab their attention. To a first century Jew, such a list at the beginning of a gospel would not have been boring. It wouldn't have been a list of meaningless names for all the curious insomniacs, but it was a dramatic family tree, telling Matthew's readers right from the start who he thought Jesus was. 
And starting that way, of course, was right up Matthew Street. Remember, he was a tax collector. Um, somebody would have loved Excel spreadsheets. He relished lists of names neatly arranged in columns, rows, and tick boxes. But this time, his motivation was not personal gain. It was that others might discover the riches that were to be found in Christ. Now, important um, events, of course, require long-term planning. We can remember when the Olympic Games was in London, how everybody was no planning for this, that, and the other, and what went wrong. It's an awful lot of detail to get sorted, or if you think of a family wedding, there are things to arrange. Well, with the coming of Jesus, God's best laid plans finally came to fulfillment. His advent, his coming, is nothing less than the culmination of God's long-term strategy, the fruition of a, the mega story that began with Abraham, the founding father of faith, who stepped out of his comfort zone into a huge adventure with his God. The birth of Jesus represents the final conclusive chapter of the sacred stories of Israel. The former slaves and escapees from Egypt who God had chosen as his special people. It's the story about Israel's kings. It's the story about David, Bethlehem born and Jerusalem based. It's about the voices and the stories of the prophets who dreamed and hoped and saw by faith the astonishing things that God would one day do to save his people from their exile. Not just their physical exile in Babylon, but their exile and sin and how God would deliver them from judgment. And so what Matthew is doing at the start of his gospel, which we give a very low score for, for grabbing our attention, but that you would give a very high score for, Matthew is here putting down a marker. He insists from the very start that Jesus was truly the idea whose time had come. He was the one who fulfilled all that had gone before as represented by all those names. The divine promise that had been conceived, kicked and heaved in the womb of Israel for 1900 years. The divine seeds that had germinated in the soil of the muddle of human history. They were coming to fruition. That year and with that child. But it's more than just a list of names. There's the divine in the detail. Matthew actually simplifies a genealogy that sometimes lapses generations. When um, it says that so-and-so was the father of so-and-so, it could be grandfather or even great-grandfather, uh, just as Jesus was said to be the son of David, and David was his father. That, the terms were used fairly loosely. And Matthew has arranged the, the, the genealogy into three large epochs or eras. One runs from Abraham to David. Abraham being the one through whom all the nations of the world would be blessed. And the, the second group of names runs from David to the exile. David, the king who came to embody the national identity of the people of God. And then the third section um, is the story of the exile running right up to Jesus. Now then, in the first group of 14 names, we are shown the origin of David's house and the royal glory. In its second, we see the rise and decline of David's royal line. And in the third, it's total eclipse as they go off into exile. But this eclipse is neither final nor lasting. It ends with Jesus the Christ. And Matthew has got three blocks of 14, which is six sevens. And seven is a wholly complete number. So after 14, 14, 14, you're in the seventh, seven. And that's the era that we are in now. We are at the, towards the end of this mega story, which started with Abraham. We're in the seventh, seven in terms of how God sees the time scale of the world. But there's extra here in this genealogy. It contains women. Do I hear a cheer? 
I mean, that wasn't unheard of in a Jewish genealogy, but it was very, very rare. And it's the women that uh, Matthew names that are really surprising. It's not just one token woman, it's four. And they're not who you'd expect. If Matthew had included Sarah, Abraham's wife, we'd have got that. Or Rebecca, a, uh, Isaac's wife. Or Leah or Rachel, the wives of Jacob. But no, we've got Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and a reference to Bathsheba. She's not named, but the reference there is to Uriah's wife. Now, why is Matthew... They sort of popped in the names or referred to four women. Well, people have speculated about this for a while, but here are just three suggestions that make sense to me. The four women were regarded in varying ways as either sinners or outsiders. And their inclusion is meant to foreshadow the role of Jesus as the savior of sinners and outsiders. If you particularly follow the story of Rahab, the prostitute, you thought, wow, well, that's in the, in the genealogy of the Messiah. And they are included to demonstrate that the Jewish Messiah was, in fact, related by ancestry to Gentiles. Remember, Ruth was a Moabitess. Not just any old Gentile, a Moabitess Gentile. And she was the grandmother of King David. And one of the things that Matthew wants to point out to his Jewish target audience is that this is the fulfillment of God reaching out to the Gentiles. Hence, he ends the gospel going out into all the world. Hence, in the nativity story, he's got three random Gentiles. Well, at least two. You know, the wise men who come to worship Jesus. Gentiles. You know, Matthew is careful with his detail that he's putting in here. He's making a point. Right in the nativity story, Gentile wise men, the Magi, came to seek out and to worship Jesus. And all four women in this genealogy share two features in common with Mary, the mother of Jesus. On the one hand, there was something extraordinary or irregular in their union with their partners. And on the other hand, it is noted that all four showed some sort of initiative or played an important part in God's plans and purposes, and so came to be considered instruments of God's providence, used by God's spirit. And it's interesting to note that in the Judaism um, uh, of the first and second century, Jewish rabbis held up these four women, not knowing that Matthew had included them, as examples of how God uses unexpected people to triumph over human obstacles and intervenes uh, in order to plan things out for the Messiah. So you see, in the first century, his target audience, these Jews, would have been gripped by the first 17 verses of his gospel. They'd have gone, wow, as they read it, in a very different way to us going, oh, let's jump straight to verse 18 and start there. Well, there, there is more here that we could uh, tease out. There's more divine in the detail, but I want to stop there. Who do you think you are? Having established who Matthew thought Jesus was, let's think about ourselves. Who do you think you are? What is your ancestry? I've alluded to the fact I've done a little bit of research on my own, and you may well have done some research, or somebody in your family has done some research uh, for you. But now I'm not thinking so much about my or your physical ancestry, that ancestry which has played a vital role in shaping our arrival into the world and into life. No, spiritual ancestry. Your spiritual ancestry is, at the end of your life, far more important because it determines eternal life. Matthew traces back Jesus to Abraham, the father of faith. And what thrills me is that I can claim that ancestry as my own. In the gospel, this ancestry in Matthew 1, 17 is mine. Galatians 3. 
Did you not know that through the gospel, writes Paul, you can share in the ancestry of Christ, understanding that those who believe are children of Abraham. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. In other words, he is your ancestor and you are an heir according to promise. I feel like we ought to be singing, Father Abraham had many sons. You know, and we do that to warm up. But seriously, this bit stuck on the beginning of Matthew's gospel that we think, mm, okay, read it as your own genealogy, your own genealogy of faith. And remember that if we continue the genealogy, we will come eventually to your name. My name is continued in heaven, in Matthew's genealogy, which can be traced back to Christ, to Abraham, by a day. So I hope... You will read this ancestry, never mind about pronouncing the names. Yeah, I just made it up as I went along. It sounded as if I knew what I was doing. It doesn't matter how you pronounce some of those funny names, but you can put your name in. Dot, dot, dot. Alan. Son of Cyril. Son of Christmas Evans. That was my grandfather's name. He was born on Christmas Day. And so we could go back and back and back. But my spiritual ancestry, it's in Christ, and it's in Abraham. And all that God ever promised to Abraham for the world is mine, because of my lineage back to Abraham, by faith in Christ. I feel excited by that. I hope you do too, as you put your own name in. To the Christmas story and look at Matthew oh. 1, to 7, 1 to 17 in a new and exciting light. Let's pray. Once again, Heavenly Father, we marvel at your hand through human history. The human history that in so many ways was a mess and a muddle. Through many dangers, toils and snares, your promise had to come. And yet come it did. And as we celebrate the bursting of light in the darkness of the birth of Jesus, as we celebrate the long wait being over, we celebrate too the fact some 2,000 years later, as we continue to wait for your coming, that our names, our stories are bound up with the story that we celebrate at this time of the year. Thank you that you have gifted us the faith to believe in Jesus, that we are truly sons of David and children of Abraham. Holy Spirit of God, impress the wonder of that in our hearts, that with Matthew's readers, we might be amazed, we might be knocked for six as we contemplate and are set free by the truth that we now believe. So hear our prayer. And may something of our faith, our belief in all that Christmas is, whether we're telling the story of a Christmas tree or Advent candles or mince pies, Lord, may they be a means of others coming into this ancestral line that goes back millennia, goes back to your promise of salvation. Lord, hear our prayer. Amen.